There is a house in a neighborhood that no one ever goes to. Or at least we think. No one ever seems to be living there normally. But sometimes there are strange cars that pull in there during random nights. I swear that I walked by one night and saw someone on the front porch just staring at me. But I couldn't tell. I was staring at what I thought were eyes, just waiting for some movement. But whatever it was, never moved. Someone distracted me by calling my name. And when I looked back, whatever it was had disappeared. I felt like I had just imagined it. So in the neighborhood, it was just known that there was something odd about the house. So when it was the week of Halloween, and we saw some construction happening in the front yard, we were all confused. There was a crew putting up plywood walls and painting it black. I asked one of the guys what they were doing, and he said all he knew is that they needed to put up some walls and was not sure what it was for. The neighborhood was getting excited as we saw some Halloween decorations multiplying in their front yard of a once quiet and seemingly abandoned house. It was Halloween night and my friends and I saw a huge line outside the abandoned house. It had transformed into a full-blown professional haunted house. Truly amazing, we all thought. There were people in costumes handing out candy to people in line. You could hear some fun screams inside the newly constructed walls. We got in line, of course, looking forward to seeing what it was all about. But whose idea was it to build a haunted house here? I did notice one thing while standing there. I saw people going in, but I never saw anybody coming out. I thought it was odd, but I figured there must be a reasonable explanation. As we entered the walls, we were finally inside. There was a red light illuminating in the background, and the usual haunted house stuff. It was awesome. Lots of jump scares from people. The pathway of walls took us through the house, where we saw the bloody kitchen with fake body parts everywhere and a butcher guy with a big meat cleaver scaring us. It was fun and scary. We proceeded through the house and went through the basement. Then we started to see things that we couldn't explain. Things moving on their own and chairs levitating in the air. I don't know how they did it, but it was impressive. I started to have the hairs in the back of my neck stand up when there was a giant hole in the basement wall and we were going through it. We were now in the sewer, which was still decorated, but smelled terrible. Everyone in line was starting to regret their decision and we started to look for a way out. There were some manhole exits to left and right where some people were going up metal ladders to get out of the smelly sewer but my friends and I had to see where this haunted house was ending. We keep moving forward, and suddenly, it was just the four of us. We were all walking toward the darkness, when we heard a loud, animalistic roar in the distance. We all looked at each other, feeling scared, and started to back up. I looked around and saw some red paint on the walls all around us. Something caught my foot in the sewer water I was stepping in. I bent over to pick whatever it was up out of the water, and in my hand was a human skull. That was our cue to get the hell out of there. Suddenly, we heard a grunting sound on a creature that was running as fast as possible right towards us. We all ran back where everyone else escaped, trying to get away from the creature. When the light hit, it looked like a massive man with hair all over his body. We were in a full sprint now, and all located an exit. We went up the ladders and got to the surface just in time. I could see the wolf-like creature below when I closed the manhole. We all ran to the line and told everyone not to go. It was a trap. The people in line were a little confused, like they did not believe us, when suddenly there was a faint scream sound. There was a mad rush from inside the house, people stampeding out and knocking each other over. My friends and I had done our job of warning everyone, and we were leaving. The last thing I saw when we were far enough away is the wolfman now tearing through three people running away from that house. It was the worst Halloween I had ever experienced. A few friends and I were going to a mysterious Halloween rave the night of Halloween. No one knew where it was 
but everyone was talking about it in our somewhat small city of 80,000 people. We were a military town, so there were a lot of transient young people that had moved around with their parents over the years. So anything exciting and different from our boring normal life was really interesting. There were some flyers that came out the week before, but we could all tell that it was just this guy Ryan that was trying to use the excitement of the rave just to get people to come over to his house. The address on the flyer was his house address, hardly a location for a secret underground rave. The day of Halloween fell on a Friday this particular year. I was at school when the real deal, legitimate flyer was found. It looked professional, but the artists were unbelievable. It had Sarah Landry, Charlie Sparks, Farago, Raven, and Selective Response. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't pass on seeing Sarah Landry in real life. My cousin said that she had been to the best concert she had ever seen at 516 South Anderson Street in Los Angeles. I was too young for that at the time, but if I could see her tonight, that would be a dream. I was in. We had the location. It was under the I-40 bridge in an industrial area at 7 p.m. The buzz about the concert was all over and it seemed to be really happening. My friends and I got our costumes ready. We started heading to the location. We got there at 7.20 and could hear the booming in the distant background. We had found the rave. We walked closer, following the sounds. We could see a light show and chem like colors in the distance. We finally got there. We got to the dance floor and the music was so loud and hitting so hard. I looked up at the DJ and it was really her, Sarah Landry. Everyone was jumping and dancing like crazy. We were dancing for a solid hour straight when this cute girl was getting close to me when I was dancing. I thought she was hot, so I danced with her. She seemed to have something special going on, some sexual energy between both of us. I was having the time of my life. I left the crowd to get some water, and the girl followed me. We were flirting and hanging out when she looked at me and said, I like you. I told her, I like you too. I got some waters and gave her one, and she repeated, I like you. At this moment, I realized that I had not really talked to her at all. We were using body language to communicate, or I was talking to her, but she was not talking to me. I tried to get her to engage in an actual conversation, but she would just nod and not respond to me. I finally cornered her on the question by saying, What do you think? She said, I like you. One more time. I decided to start distancing myself from her. I told her that it was nice to meet her, but I had to get back to my friends. We were all supposed to be hanging out after all. She just stared at me. I was not sure if she understood what I was saying. I started to walk away from her and she looked like she was tearing up. I got back to my friends and told them she was weird and would only say one thing over and over. We were all dancing some more when I saw the girl slowly make her way back to where we were in the dance area. I saw this and told the guys to go forward towards the stage. We got on the stage in the background, hoping she would not follow us. As I was dancing, I saw her piercing eyes staring at me. She looked like I betrayed her, but I didn't even know her. I'm glad she finally got the hint and kept her distance though. So now that that was over, I can just say, it was the best concert of my life. My friends and I were all going our separate ways, and suddenly I found myself alone. In the distance, I saw the girl again. She was not saying anything, but was staring at me like she was waiting for me. I walked in a diagonal pattern to avoid her. Then I saw the scariest thing I had ever seen. She bent backwards and put her hands on the ground. With her hands and her feet, she was approaching me at a speed that seemed impossible. I ran as fast as I could from her. 
but in her awkward pose, she was way too fast. I heard some people in the distance and ran towards their voices. I got to them and I said, please help me. Surprised and concerned, they all asked me what's going on. I said, there's a woman chasing me, and they all laughed at me. Man, I wish I had your problems. They looked back to where I said the woman was, and they said they couldn't see anybody. They offered me a ride. I got home safe and sound, but I realized what might have happened. I might have fallen in love with the skinwalker, but it was different from the stories I had heard. I thought they were supposed to be disgusting creatures, but she was beautiful. She was trying to lure me away from everyone so she could do whatever it is that she was trying to do. She almost had me until I realized that she could only say one phrase, which was probably the last words of her last victim. It was the week of Halloween and I noticed something strange. It had been happening all week. Someone was dressing up as horror movie characters and following me. It started when I saw someone dressed as Michael Myers. I saw him from a distance by a tall bush along the sidewalk I was walking on to get home. He did this weird thing where he turned his head sideways 45 degrees and stared at me. I paused in my walk, concerned, but continued to walk down the sidewalk after a second. He disappeared behind the bushes. When I got to the bushes, I looked behind him and saw no one. I got home that day and saw the same character outside my window, staring up at my apartment window. The next day, when I was driving to the store, I saw someone walk in front of my car from the woods. Whoever it was had a Friday the 13th costume on, which was very movie accurate from the fourth movie specifically. They stopped in front of my car as they crossed the street, turning their head towards me and just stared at me. I tried to see their eyes, but I only saw blackness where their eyes should have been. After a minute or so, they turned their head and continued to walk across the street. That night, I got a phone call from the best scream impersonator I had ever heard asking me if I liked scary movies and all that. I played along, but I was looking out my window at the same time to see if someone was there. I looked carefully and couldn't find anyone. The caller asked me if I saw anything out the window. I paused for a minute and wondered how the caller knew that. They said, I can see you. I closed the curtains to the window and ran to the front door to make sure it was locked. On my way to the front door, the closet burst open behind me and a guy with a scream costume with a real knife started swinging violently at me. The momentum I already had took me straight to the front door. I ran and opened it and got through, went down the stairs of my apartment and got to the parking lot. I looked behind me expecting someone to be chasing me, but I did not see anyone. I called the police. They searched the apartment and did not find anything except for a note. The note only had two words on it. Halloween night. So it's finally Halloween, and I'm so paranoid I'm going crazy. I look at every person as if they're a suspect, and every time it's just some normal person. At this point, the police are following me to make sure I was safe, but I did not feel safe at all. If I could make it through this day, I would be okay, I thought. I kept a low profile, and got through the day. I was invited to a lot of parties, but I turned them all down. Someone was after me for some reason, and I didn't know why. So I wasn't going to risk it by going to some party. The sun set finally, and I felt like this was my end game. I went to my apartment and said goodnight to the police. They told me they'd be parked outside of my place until the morning in case someone suspicious came through. With that, I felt safe and turned in for the night. I brushed my teeth and went to bed. It was sad being forced to skip Halloween, but it was for my life. With the night ending and the police on the lookout, I could finally relax. 
I was woken up in the middle of the night by a noise that startled me. I woke up to see a man dressed as Freddy Krueger standing at the foot of my bed. The last thing I can remember is the knife glove coming towards my face. A group of college kids just couldn't grow up, especially on Halloween night. They would revert back to their young selves and play silly games. They all got some drinks and went to the local cemetery. They were going to play Ghost in the Graveyard. The rules are simple. Have everyone except for the ghost stand at the home base while the ghost runs off and hides somewhere in the graveyard. Now, the home base players try to find the ghost. Meanwhile, the ghost attempts to jump out and tag players. If someone sees the ghost, they yell, Ghost in the Graveyard, and run back to home base. This game was going to be an exciting callback to their fun from their past, and would be a great relief to them now that they were expected to do so much adulting. There was something interesting about the graveyard on this particular night. It felt darker than usual. The moon was bigger tonight, but for some reason, it wasn't brighter. There was a dense fog around the graveyard that was cold when you passed through it. It was a perfect example of what a haunted graveyard should look like. It was perfect for tonight. They picked Robert to be the first ghost. He was fast and would get the game started right. They all went to home base, the grave of a man named Chester Brown. The group was stepping all over his grave, not paying attention to the morality of stepping on a human's grave, but were more concerned with the game above all else. Robert disappeared into the fog, mocking them that he would find them and scare them all. A few minutes went by, giving Robert the time he needed to hide somewhere. When enough time had passed by, everyone was unleashed into the graveyard. There was a lot of space and great places to hide, so Robert could be anywhere. Sam was all alone and wandering the graveyard, looking everywhere for Robert. He heard something and was convinced he had found Robert. He slowly crept over to the noise and prepared to jump past the tombstone to surprise Robert. He jumped forward and yelled, Ghost in the graveyard. It was Robert, but there was something wrong. Robert was a deformed and terrifying version of himself. His skin was melted. His eyes were blood red and sticking out of his face, and his clothes were ripped. Sam's smile dropped, and he took off to home base. He ran as fast as possible, completely terrified. He heard something chasing him, and it was right behind him. He got to home base, turned around, and Robert was not there. What the hell was that? Did Robert put on makeup, or was it something else? How did he look so convincingly like a terrifying monster? Suddenly, Sam heard multiple footsteps from different directions. From all directions, he saw Kanisha running towards him, then Becky, then Mondeep, and Mike. Everyone was back at home plate, and all had the same terrifying story about Robert's appearance. With either a shared delusion or something really wrong, they were done with this game and just wanted to go home. Suddenly, Robert came out of the fog. He looked completely normal. Robert said, I got all of you. He looked at the concern from everybody's face and asked, What's wrong? They all told him that they saw him out there, and he looked like a monster. He laughed it off and said, Look at me. It's just me. Your mind is playing tricks on you. After that, even though Robert tried to reassure the crowd, No one wanted to play anymore. They all walked back to their cars and called it a night. No one could explain how they had a shared mass hysteria. They did. As they were walking towards their cars, Sam looked back at the graveyard. In the distance, he could see a figure watching the group leave, then turning around to head deeper into the graveyard.
everyone loves getting scared at haunted houses, and a group of guys plus one girl, Matt, Will, Keith, and Bethany, were no exception. They were looking for the scariest haunted house they could find and planned on going for Halloween. They have been to all kinds of haunted houses in the country, big and small, looking for the perfect one. But they were never satisfied because they thought all these haunted houses weren't very scary. They knew it was fake, and the rush they got when they were kids would just never be fulfilled. As they exited their sixth haunted house of October, a stranger approached them. He asked, How was it? They looked at him with disappointed faces and said, It's fine, but it's the same old thing. He looked excited to hear that because he was about to pitch them an exciting new opportunity. How would you like to go to a real scary haunted house for Halloween? They all looked intrigued. The haunted house he referred to was not open to the public and was only by special invitation. The man said, I know you've been looking for something more exciting than this. Are you interested? They all said yes and exchanged information. They left each other and would soon see each other with the promise of a real haunted house. Halloween was coming up and they all received their official invitation. There was a cryptic message that accompanied the ticket, but they all assumed it was part of the game. They got in the car and put the provided coordinates into the GPS. It pointed to an old, condemned neighborhood. They were all excited to go on this new adventure. They arrived, and there were guards at the front entrance. After talking to the guards, they were confirmed to be guests, and proceeded to park the car and head inside. There were a few other groups of people entering the main building at the same time. With everyone gathered, there was a major announcement from a man named Victor Bran. Hello everyone, Victor said. Welcome to the scariest haunted house you will ever find. As he was talking, there were footsteps and knocking sounds in the background. Everyone was looking around at the various noises, but Victor seemed to be oblivious to all the noises in the background. You are all here because you have been seeking out a haunted house. Well, this house is haunted, or something is really wrong with it. Here's the proposal. If you can last an hour in this house without exiting, you will win $100,000 each. Excited, everyone looked at each other and were happy with the additional benefit, but really they were just there for the scares. They all agreed, and Victor and his friends quickly exited their last words. Good luck. The group of 15 people looked at each other and laughed at the situation. What a joke. As they were laughing, something fell in the other room. They all heard it and moved towards the noise. In the kitchen, there was a book that fell on the floor. Suddenly, all the cabinets opened, and knives and plates flew out of the drawers. Multiple knives hit different people. This was starting to get real. Shocked to see that this wasn't a joke, three contestants sprinted for the door, namely the ones with knives protruding from their skin. The chairs at the table flew in all directions, hitting another person. The chandelier fell to the ground as well, and shattered into pieces. Matt looked at Bethany. Do you want to get out of here? Bethany said, no. Let's just make sure we're not going to get hurt by something. The group got out of the kitchen, and were now in the living room. Objects in the living room were flying at them as well. Pictures flying off the walls. Lamps smashing into walls. When the couches came after them, they all quickly ran upstairs. They found a bedroom with not much in it. They grabbed all the loose items they could find and threw it out in the hallway. They closed the door and huddled up in a circle. As a group, they had determined that this is where they were going to stay for the next 50 minutes. Unfortunately, their plan was ruined by this crazy house. 20 minutes had passed by and they heard items slamming into walls and ceilings, glass breaking, and people screaming. They were terrified to leave this room at this point, but felt somewhat comfortable. They were all looking at each other and just wanted this to be over. Out of nowhere, 
Will started shaking violently and foaming at the mouth. They all jumped up, and Will fell over. He was dead. Bethany cried as she ran to the door. However, she stopped in her tracks. They all saw a puddle on the ground that came under the door. When they opened the door, water started slowly coming in, which was from an overflowing sink. The water must have got to Will, and the water must be electrified. With this new threat, Matt broke the window and they all went to the roof. They walked across the roof a little bit while looking for safe passage. Matt found another window and broke it. They were looking for an alternate way down the stairs to avoid the electrified puddle. They entered the next room and went to the door to open it. The curtains they passed by caught fire quickly and suddenly the room was ablaze. They all exited the room and were now in the hallway. Enough was enough, they thought. Keith, let's get the hell out of here. They went down the hallway as fast as possible, avoiding furniture and books slamming into the wall everywhere. Another room was on fire now. The bathroom sinks exploded and water was shooting all over the place. The windows all exploded as they were running towards the door, glass flying everywhere. There was a roaring sound like the sound of a freight train or a tornado. This was pure madness. They all finally got to the front door and ran through it. They made it about 10 steps out the door and all the chaotic noises suddenly stopped. In front of them was Victor with two of his guys. Victor said, you all didn't make it. You had 20 minutes left. No money for you, all right? But he just didn't understand. We didn't care about the money anymore. Bethany screamed at Victor. You heartless bastard. We just lost our friend Will in that house. Victor said, Who is Will? When you came, it was just you three. They were all confused. Was Victor crazy or lying? Bethany said, Will came with us. And you shook his hand. Don't tell me you don't remember him. Victor said, honestly, I don't know what you're talking about. You have to understand that this house is actually haunted, and you acknowledged when you signed a waiver of liability. The house makes you see things that aren't there. When he said that, they all looked back at the house. There was no fire, flood, or broken glass. The house was in perfect condition. Bethany looked back and asked Victor, where are all the other people that played the game? Victor, looking irritated, said, There are no other people. We brought you three here to do the challenge, and that's it. Now if you're ready, you can get out of here. They all got in the car and started driving away from the house, happy that they still had their lives. As they were leaving the area, Bethany looked back. She saw Will with hundreds of people behind him, staring at them driving away, with their white, ghostly glow contrasting with the dark very well. Haunted houses can be fun, but don't look for something too scary. It might be the scariest thing you ever did. A group of friends gathered around a table on Halloween night. The objective was to test if this magic cup was really real. Someone had found videos on TikTok of a group of teenagers that found a cup with mysterious powers. When they drank from the cup, according to the onlookers in the crowd, they would convulse, their eyes would turn black, and they would say and do really crazy things. Nothing too crazy, just things like cry, and tell funny stories about themselves, say crazy stuff, things like that. It was like a paranormal way to pull something out of you, and it was just so entertaining. So Brian tracked down the group that had the cup and got it. He saved it especially for this night, Halloween night. Everyone gathered around as Brian slowly pulled the cup from the box. It was a plain cup with ancient carvings on it, 
with some more recent Sharpie writings on top of the ancient carvings. The modern writing said, do not drink from this, the devil's chalice, and cursed. The teenagers read all of this and laughed. So dramatic, one of them said. Brian asked the crowd, who wants to go first? Kaylee said, I'll go. Everyone looked at her with shock and laughter. She was the smallest person in the room at 5'2 and 100 pounds, but she was the first to volunteer for this unexpected challenge. Haley asked what she had to do. Brian laid out the rules. He explained, first, you have to put alcohol in the cup. It doesn't matter what kind. Second, you need to prick your finger and add a drop of your own blood. She looked questionably at Brian, like, what did she just sign up for? He reassured her and said, just a small amount will do. Then he told her the most important thing. Third, you must say these words correctly or something can happen that is not good. The words were, Klaatu, Vrata, Niktu. He told her to practice, but she was insulted by the request. She could say three words, and correctly. He needed to lighten up and stop micromanaging her. This was supposed to be fun. As Kaylee started the ritual, everyone pulled out their phones to record the whole thing. She put vodka in a cup and swished it around, giving the cup a little sniff, as if to ensure the vodka was really in the cup. Vodka has a terrible alcohol smell, but there's something about it that is alluring. Next. Brian gave her a pen to prick her finger. She did, and placed a drop of her blood in the vodka-filled cup. Next was the words. She looked at Brian and said, Klaatu, Vrata, Biktu. Extremely concerned, Brian ran straight to her and tried to stop her from taking the drink. She messed up the words, and that is not good. He was too late, though. Kaylee quickly slammed the drink and wiped her mouth. She looked up, though, and saw fire and flames everywhere. It was a terrifying display of a hellscape. She was no longer in the house, but in hell. There were creatures down here, too. Then she saw something that really concerned her. She saw a demonic presence approach her, howling in her face. She panicked and picked up a sharp stick and stabbed the demon through the head. It fell to the ground. Then, multiple demons approached her from the left, howling with an unbearable sound. She used her stick to dispatch all the demons that were coming to attack her. With all the demons dead, she wandered around the hellscape to find a way out. Why did she agree to this? This was crazy. Suddenly, two more demons approached her, but they were keeping their distance. These demons were different from the rest for some reason in the way they were behaving. They were howling, but they were holding guns and were pointing them right at her. Feeling like her life was in danger, she charged at them with her stick, but she didn't make it. She was gunned down by those demons and was dead. What really happened was different than what was perceived. Haley was shot by police responding to a domestic disturbance back at the house where the ritual was performed. Everyone except one person was dead. They all had suffered from knife wounds. After drinking from the cup, Haley had lost her mind and went on a murderous rampage. First, she killed Brian when he tried to stop her. Then everyone else got off the couch and tried to stop her. She took them all out. They thought that Kaylee was small, and they could all stop her together, but they were wrong. In the chaos, one girl was able to sneak away and call the police. She survived, but the damage was already done. The cup had the ability to make people do funny and outlandish things, but the ritual had to be done right. If not, there were major consequences. They knew of the dangers and did it anyways. Ancient artifacts are nothing to mess with. Through its long life, an object could have something attached to it that you don't want to let out.
I have a story from my childhood that still gives me the chills to this day. It was Halloween night, and I was out with my friends trick-or-treating. We were hitting all the houses up that had their porch lights on, while avoiding the ones that did not have any lights at all. We had pillowcases with us so we could get the maximum amount of candy home without missing any. Call it the fear of missing out, but we were not going to miss anything tonight. We were all dressed up as different Ninja Turtles and had fake, real-looking weapons and everything. So we hit up about 50 houses and our pillowcases were getting full. We were all together laughing and joking. The streets were filled with people dressed up and doing the same thing we were doing. We had hit up almost all the houses in a particular neighborhood when we realized that we were at the edge of the neighborhood light. If we were to proceed any further forward, we would be in the darkness. But this is a safe area, and we weren't worried too much about something dangerous happening. But it was rather eerie how the light from the streetlight cut off so dramatically, and anywhere past it was complete darkness. That's when it happened. There was a voice in the darkness. It said, Hey, little boy, come here. We all froze in fear and looked at each other with the most terrifying expressions on our faces. It was clear that everyone had heard the same thing, and it was not a figment of our imagination. There was a voice in the darkness calling to us, and we couldn't see anything either. It was just dark. When we did not respond, the voice yelled, You better come here now, or I'm coming to get you. We all panicked. We dropped our candy and ran as fast as possible to the biggest adult we could find. We told him that there was someone in the darkness that was trying to get us to come to him. The big man confidently went to the location we showed him and shined his flashlight into the darkness. He told the voice to come out now. Suddenly breaking the silence, all you could hear was a fast run over leaves, but you couldn't see anything. Suddenly, a disfigured man tackled the big man at full speed, knocking him down. He started beating the big man right in front of us. At least the big guy was smart enough to tell his other big buddies where he was going. His friends rushed over to the situation that was going down and grabbed the crazy man and secured him to the ground. The police were called and took the deranged man into custody. It turns out that this man was a transient, shacking up near neighborhoods with the intent to rob the houses, selling the stolen items, and moving on to a new neighborhood. But what did he want with us? He could have just been silent and continued his ruse. Sometimes it keeps me up at night trying to figure out what would have happened if we had gone to the darkness towards his voice. It was October and the small town I lived in was in full swing decorating for Halloween. There were pumpkins on the porch, fake graves in the yard, and spider webs everywhere. It was very festive and really fun to see what new things people would come up with to up their Halloween competition game. It was a competition in a fun way as all the people knew each other and they were very kind. It was actually the perfect area to grow up in, that is, until something happened that has haunted my memories forever. We didn't know who at the time, but somebody started stealing the pumpkins. But it wasn't just that. The first pumpkin that went missing was Miss Curtis's. Her house was decorated well, and her pumpkins were top-notch. However, her pumpkins were missing. She asked around to see if anyone knew who would have taken the pumpkins, and why. She asked the sheriff as well, just to let him know what happened. The next day, the sheriff went to Miss Curtis's house to talk to her more about the pumpkin kidnapping, but she was not there. Her car was in the driveway, and her door was unlocked, but she was nowhere to be found. The sheriff searched the whole house and found no trace of her. As the sheriff was walking away from Miss Curtis's house, he got a call from dispatch that Mr. Carpenter needed to talk to the sheriff right away. The sheriff drove straight over and saw Mr. Carpenter. He asked what the trouble was, and Mr. Carpenter told him that his pumpkins were missing as well. With a rising sense of anxiety, he asked Mr. Carpenter if he had noticed anything suspicious. 
There was no additional information except for the fact that the pumpkins were missing. Hoping that Miss Curtis's sudden disappearance was an isolated incident, the sheriff told Mr. Carpenter to be safe and that he would be back in the morning to check on him. He went back to the station to file a missing persons report on Mrs. Curtis and looked for any available family to ask if they knew of her whereabouts. There was no one listed as next of kin in the system. The next day, the sheriff got up, ate breakfast, and drove straight to Mr. Carpenter's house. Once again, the car was in the driveway. The door was unlocked, but there was no Mr. Carpenter. Now, extremely frustrated, the sheriff was getting concerned. He went back to the station to file a missing persons report on Mr. Carpenter and find a contact for a family member, but once again, there was no next of kin listed. While he was at the station, dispatch came over and told him that a Mr. Loomis was on the phone, and once again, there were missing pumpkins. The sheriff drove over there, got the story, and told Mr. Loomis about the disappearances that both started with the front porch pumpkins missing the day before. Mr. Loomis brushed it off as a silly idea and said no one was going to disappear him. With the writing on the wall, the sheriff told Mr. Loomis that he would be back the next day to check on him. But he lied. The sheriff picked out a great spot and hid from any eyes that could find him around Mr. Loomis's residence. The sheriff waited for a while with nothing happening. It was about two in the morning when the sheriff saw a white creeper van pull up to Mr. Loomis's house. Two big men got out and entered the front door. However they entered, it was a clean way like picking a lock or something, which made it harder to realize that it was an abduction case. The two men exited the house with a body bag in tow. They threw it in the back of the van and drove off. The sheriff followed them to a trailer deep in the woods. He waited until they unloaded the bag and entered the trailer. He got his Sig Sauer and shotgun ready and proceeded to the trailer, ready for a fight. He kicked the door open and told the two men to get on the ground now. One did, but the other started backing up with his hands behind his back. The sheriff told him to show his hands, but there was no response. The sheriff saw what the man was going for, a gun in a jacket that was hanging up in the corner of the room. The man pulled the gun, and the sheriff shot him directly in the head. The other man didn't move. He was not in a good position to do anything and realized that the sheriff was not messing around. The sheriff took the man into custody and put him in the back of his unit. He looked around the trailer now that it was safe. He found 12 pumpkins in the trailer and the body bag. It was Mr. Loomis, but he was not dead, just sedated. The sheriff went outside and saw an additional trailer he had not seen before. He went in with his gun drawn. He opened the door and yelled for anyone to come out with their hands up. There, he saw 11 people with duct tape on their mouths and hands up already, bound and tied to the wall. He saw Mr. Carpenter and Miss Curtis. The additional people he saw were younger adults that he did not even know were missing. He called for additional backup from the state and was able to save everyone. The FBI came in as well, eager to question the man that was alive and responsible for the abduction. Apparently, they were collecting people for involuntary organ harvesting, but the man refused to say who their employer was. All he would say is that our small towns were no longer safe. It was the prime target for their business, because people are so stupid and trusting there. He said that our town had figured it out, but there are more towns and people like them abducting people. Business goes on as usual. When I asked him why they stole the pumpkins, he simply said, I like pumpkins, and it seemed like a funny calling card to steal the pumpkins first, then the people. The FBI sent out a special message to 86 small towns in the area. They were able to arrest 172 men for kidnapping and rescued 946 innocent people from organ harvesting, all because a lone sheriff saw something and did something to stop it. One man can make a difference. Sandra and Ben were parents of Olivia. 
They wanted to be the best parents ever and tried to make sure they did what was best for their daughter. It was Halloween night and they wanted to make sure she had the best experience possible. The last neighborhood they lived in had about 18 children that did everything together. Unfortunately, they decided to move to a bigger and better house far across town. With the new gated community, there was barely anyone out trick-or-treating or houses giving out candy. They went through the whole neighborhood and Olivia had enough candy to fill a sandwich-sized Ziploc bag. She looked devastated. Olivia got so much candy at her last neighborhood that she had to practically give it away for the next two months. It was a big unfortunate change and she was so sad. Seeing his daughter in distress though, Ben decided that they should go to another neighborhood in hopes that they would be busier. He had considered going back to their old neighborhood, but decided that they were starting a new life with a new house and should try to explore the surrounding area. They picked a random neighborhood on the GPS that looked fine and it was about a mile away. They got in the car and started driving. Olivia's sad face soon turned into a happy one as she was going to get lots of candy now. This night had really turned around for her. They parked the car and started going around the houses. The candy was plentiful and there was a major variety, even regular sized candies, but the people in this particular neighborhood were weird in some way. They were all slurring their speech, they were way too touchy, and they just had that psycho vibe about them. Olivia didn't notice, but Sandra and Ben did for sure. But because Olivia was happy, they didn't want to stop her from having a good night. They finally made it around enough that Olivia was satisfied with her full bag of candy. They all looked at each other and decided that they would go home. They told Olivia not to touch the candy until they got home though. There was a faint smell of alcohol emanating from the back seat, but it could have just been the smell of Lifesaver gummies or something. They got home and put a towel down, played a Halloween special. Olivia was watching TV as Sarah and Ben went through the candy. They found an open candy. Aha, Sandra said. Ben just looked at her and shook his head. We used to be so cool, and now we're getting excited about finding an open wrapper. They both laughed and continued looking. They found another, and another, and another. Sandra's face was ghostly white at what she was seeing. Almost all the candy was open, and there was something else. There was a blue ooze coming out of the candy. Sandra opened one of the open candies and found more blue ooze. She broke a peanut butter cup open and found at the center was a concentration of some blue ooze stuff. Concerned, they called the police. When the police arrived, they looked at the candy and got the information of the neighborhood they went to. The police were gone for a while, but came back an hour later. The news he gave us, though, was a bit concerning. The police officer said that the neighborhood had a major issue a few years back, and all the residents had moved out. No one lived there. Sandra explained that there were people at all the houses, and all the lights were on. The officer explained that the city bought the neighborhood. They compensated all the families so they could get new houses, and they were set to demolish the entire area. They wanted to keep the lights on though, so it did not attract squatters. So it is possible that someone could have been here and there, but on the scale that Sandra was talking about, it would have taken a busload of people and be a coordinated evolution. Sandra asked what was in the candy. The officer said that he wasn't sure, but someone put that in all the candy, probably with a needle with a blue liquid of some kind. He said, don't touch any of it though. The officer left and Sandra and Ben were devastated. What kind of world do we live in? So they all got in the car and drove to Walmart and got Olivia some candy. In the end, everyone was happy. Be careful going to random neighborhoods you don't know.